All right, so welcome anyone who is um, here with us on Zoom or also on our Facebook Live. My name's Ash Good, and I'm here with First Matter Press, and we're here for our Combos in Cohort series. And I'm gonna just begin today um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, we honor the First Nations, Indigenous peoples, and traditional custodians of these lands, past, present, and emerging. We are curating this conversation from Portland, Oregon, the traditional and ancestral lands of the Multnomah, Clackamas, Chinook, Kathlamet, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette regions. And if you know the names of the First Nation peoples where you are, um, please take this time to acknowledge them now in your mind and in your heart. And if you do not know their names, let this be an invitation to commit to learning those names and investing yourself in ongoing learning of these histories and the present day experiences of indigenous people and communities where you are. And in this online space that we share together today, we recognize our responsibility to center and work in solidarity with indigenous communities and other communities negatively impacted by settler colonialism. And we recognize that these words are not enough and the action and investment are required. Just to tell you a little bit about First Matter Press, um, I'm one of the co-founding editors and we were founded in 2018. Since then we have 12 titles that are either available or in production. And our goal as a press is to dissolve publication barriers for first time publishing poets and genre bending writers. And our method and our operational method as a press is to invite a collective of writers into cohort each year where they um, crystallize their manuscripts in dialogue with the editors and the other fellow writers in their cohort. And they also collaborate with featured artists on original cover art. So for each year's release, we have one featured cover artist. Um, and as you'll see the, the kind of assortment of cover arts that we've had in the past here. And we're really excited that we just a couple months ago uh, received our nonprofit designation. So we're now officially a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And all of our authors maintain 100% copyrights and sales ro royalties for their work. And our, currently our editors include myself, Ashgood, Lauren Paradis, Carolyn Wilcox Rule, and Andra Voltaveen. So I'm going to hand this over to Carolyn now, who's going to talk a little bit about the origin of the Conversation in Cohorts series. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ash. Um, yeah, so, so this year, as, um, as we've expanded our number of authors, that's to nine, and the published titles, um, and, which Ash mentioned, is uh, currently 12 starting in uh, September, uh, the four of us editors have been talking about what our values are and where we want to head as a collective. Um, our interest in community, both in our individual writing practices and as a press has been a constant. And we've been actively exploring how we can foster community in our uh, publishing life. Uh, also this year, uh, kind of at the same time, we've been working together with our three poets, Dan, Jessica, and Gabby, and have been really conscious of some common threads in the three manuscripts and talked often about how the books seem to be in conversation with each other. So we thought since the books are talking to each other, um, then let's take this opportunity to get the poets together and have a conversation about their work and maybe some common themes in their writing practice. So this is how we kind of started this idea of having a series of talks. And um, I do wanna say it's something of an experiment for us, but we're really hoping that um, we'll discover a lot of things about the three poets and their work. And maybe we'll also discover something for ourselves in our own writing practice. So um, now I'll just pass it over to Lauren to introduce our, uh, author in focus this evening. Hello, old and new friends. I'm just gonna pause my video here in case they get glitchy. Um, it's great to share this space with you and to introduce Dan Winsek, the first author in our 2021 release. Dan is a poet, critic, and humorist who lives in Portland and whose work has appeared in Southwester, New Ohio Review, Timberline Review, and other publications. Roots Between Raindrops is his first collection of poems. 
I've had the honor of reading many of Dan's poems throughout their evolution and workshop over the years. Roots Between Raindrops is indeed a celebration of community, but more importantly, it is a testament to a poet's commitment to observation and craft. Without further ado, here's Dan. Thank you, Lauren. I'm gonna be reading some selections from the book. The first is called The House As It Was. We drove beyond my tiny map into the city to the relatives I did not know. The steps were so tall. Their house smelled of old wood, chocolate dust, carpets of long memory. I blended into the corduroy sofa. There was yellow light on the walls, photographs of paintings, a plant probably. I wandered, ignored and free, my parents' voices spilling out from behind a bright corner. An empty bedroom, slippers, drape hems, the hulks of furniture looming in the dim. A door leading to a back porch locked to me, buildings breathing exotic air. I populate this place with symbols it left me, a wardrobe pelted by clock ticks, floorboards that sighed under my young palms, the dreams of old wood. Where the fence was. A boy with a hollow bat pursuing a rabbit over the once border meets the empty post hole. The ankle sinks, shears, and the boy's whales dissolve in an expanse of yard now without boundary, one shade of green mingling with another as a sprinkler's incantations hold entropy at bay for one more afternoon. Survival Machines, this is uh, prefaced by an epigraph from Richard Dawkins. We are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment from the selfish gene. I've challenged Superman to a cornhole match inside a subterranean parking garage. He wears his muscles on his shirt. Cars stretch in rows to impossible horizons as beanbags slap wood like gavel blows echoing. There is no crime this far below ground, only the contests we set ourselves. No one ever thought to ask whether cars made us evolve so that one day we might invent them. A pilgrim to Lourdes happening upon this place would fall to his knees. I ask myself what I can claim responsibility for and whether air conditioning is worth the desecration of paradise. I'm beaten easily. We pass a 40 back and forth until Superman cocks his head to something I cannot hear, says this looks like a job for him, and dashes off to save capitalism again. Verso and recto. Over one shoulder, a wind whispering truths. The sun warms the heartless and kind alike. The water will run out. You can pray all you want. Over the other, a choice of either promise or lie. We can soothe the sky with a snowball fight and two eyes made out of coal. For every inch of glacial melt, there is a mutual fund. For every extinct species, an orgy. The devil thinks himself safe in hell because it cannot get any worse, while the angel stands with an egg on her feet, fearful lest it touch ice. The bridge fell on some unrecorded night. Perhaps a car innocently swan dove between the stumps of its foundations and shattered the glassy floor, or a gull sought its reassuring breath only to pinch empty air in its talons. Draw a deep inverted sigh in tribute, cast off bits of living and non-living, and hold it all within until breath is a moment writhing in tweezers. And there had never been a bridge at all, the river remaining uncrossed by traffic. In the letting go, saw becomes seeing, and seeing becomes a hypothesis of gulls perched regally on cars protruding from still water. Antidote. Poison against poison, salamander against mandrake, 
rattlesnake versus a kick in the pants. Rip the tape off to leave a landing strip of angry pink skin. Hemlock against blame, drain cleaner against not calling mom for two months running. Sorry, ma, the new job is a bear. Spray a mix of water and alcohol and apply the stencil. Ah, but I was so much older then in light script. Cyanide against hepatitis C. Treat guilt over being a bad son with a poultice of mint, moldy bread, and shredded Father's Day cards. Fight a 43rd birthday with a prowl through the hotel bar. Impotence with a ring through the nipple. Cobra venom counters apathy. Radium, the only sure cure for not owning a passport. The Seven Labors. I hid a promise in the rolled up flag and smuggled the teeth in a bottle of yellow perfume. I raised a tower of spent car batteries, carved a peace sign out of an ice mermaid with a padlock frozen inside her breast, and filled a glove with pages from my copy of Walden. I stashed the glove in an oatmeal canister cunningly made to look like a wall safe. I tucked my wedding day smile in my boots way up in the toes. Come morning, the boots had vanished, replaced by a cat who licked his paws until the mouse blood was gone from them. Thursday afternoon, 5.25 p.m. I get home as usual to find the walrus barely shifted, crowned merrily on a pile of his own laundry. No fish today, you fat bastard, I ask. And he shimmies his mighty tail, rolls over, presents a dimpled flank, and goes on reading from my copy of House of Leaves. He cracked the spine. I hate it when the fat bastard cracks the spine. This time he is Jacob. We are outdoors walking side by side, and he is next to me, the son I did not have, holding my hand, though he is far too old. The air is stuck in place, and I am desperate for a breeze. There are pictures in the clouds, but I cannot decipher them. This time he is Jacob. He would be 26 or thereabouts, and he was sacrificed for the sake of two college degrees, for if you count grad school, and I feel absurdly lucky he is with me, even if I cannot make out the details of his face. I try to lift him by his waist and nearly collapse under him. Come on, Dad, he says, laughing at me. There isn't any wind here, and the clouds are all lies anyway. Finally, tiny poisonous toads are taking over a Florida suburb. In the gurgling of 10,000 tiny throats hungry for aphids, anything seems like a good idea. I offered to check the spillway just for an excuse to say spillway. A train station abandoned, hollowed out cars lining the curbs. The spillway is empty and is actually a gator's dockside. And there is a woman swaddled in blue with glasses they don't make anymore who takes me back to the time when my clothes never fit me. I remember being asked, what if it's all much easier than we ever thought? Every day, find a new route between the raindrops. The trick is to not try. Outside, there is no one for the sun to shine on. If I met a poisonous toad, I don't know what I could do about it. We went on fighting well after we'd won because we never knew the right things to fight for. I was lucky to worry about cancer, my bills. I cringe when I hear the phrase soft tissue. My favorite shirt tells strangers I have been to Japan. Some things refuse to be stepped on. So commit suicide by toad burn rubber down Route 19 in a car that's not yours, or throw yourself at the feet of a woman in blue. At some point, everything will seem like a good idea. Tiny throats, 10,000 or more, each gurgling its own suggestion. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, we're now going to move into our conversation portion of the evening. Hello, my fellow writers. Hello. There you are. Hi. 
is uh, Jessica's here. I'm sure if you had to dash off for a child emergency. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> all right. I think I got all you spotlighted now. So you're all up there. And um, I guess I'll just kick off this conversation with um, kind of an opening question for Dan, and then you all can take it from there. Um, I, I was wondering if Dan could just speak a little bit to uh, his process as, as a poet and maybe uh, a moment or an anecdote when you knew that you had a, a collection or a book on your hands as opposed to just mm. a pile of poems. Um, the first part of that, could be a very long answer and I don't want it to be. Um, I will say I, uh, my background was actually in prose. I did the full academic creative writing program deal, um, graduate and undergrad, and I was a fiction writer, a proser, we called ourselves, and uh, sort of hacked away at that for a long time without making a great deal of progress, never really publishing anything. And um, some years ago when I decided to sort of shake things up and write poems, I started to realize the poems were actually still kind of prose, still kind of stuck in the habits of prose and the sort of assumptions that I developed as a writer of that kind of work. And the process from that day to this has been to understand what poetry is what it can be and what I can be as a poet. And I think the way that ties into this particular collection is this, this work, most of it is fairly recent. Um, I joined Eastside Poets back in uh, what, four years ago now, five years ago. Um, most of the work is in that period. Some of it predates it, but um, it was really, um, that process of shedding habits and, and sort of discovering both the freedom and the discipline that you need to be effective as a poet. And I feel there came a point where I began to be able to write more mindfully and more um, aware in a way that did not hurt the process, in a way that didn't bog me down or get me self-conscious, but I just, I, I was practiced enough that something started to come naturally and I felt I'm beginning to cross a line mm -hmm. um, and the stuff on the other side of that line should be its own thing. So I kind of stopped and everything, you know, after that is the new stuff that is still ongoing. And then the old stuff is the book. And it, the, it was a process of going through that old stuff, seeing what still worked, what stuck out in a bad way, what stuck out in a good way and what made sense together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, Part of, I mean, it's partly it's just a bit of sweepings put together, but there are definite things I was trying to work out, things I was trying to experiment with that hopefully, you know, they, they become apparent in the book and they illuminate each other in a way that's rewarding and rewards repeated goings through. Thanks for that, Dan. I'll just toss in here as they're going through their conversation. If questions come up for you all um, that you want to stick in the chat, feel free to put them over there and we'll have a moderator bring them to the poets at the end of their conversation. And I'll let you all take it from here. Dan, I have like 17 follow-up questions for you. <laughs> yeah. So here, I will, I will offer you two and go in whichever direction you feel drawn to. Um, so one, you talked about some of the habits that you wanted to break moving mm. from prose to poetry. And I'm curious what that means to you and, and how you kind of envision that. And then the other thread, and maybe they're interconnected, is you spoke about trying to experiment with certain mm. elements mm -hmm. with this, within this particular collection. So those mm. are the two things that really stuck out to me from what you just said. Um, they might actually be the same answer. Um, Lovely. Brilliant. With, uh, well, with prose, it, it's very much about narrative. It's about characters and settings, um, people in an environment, whatever kind of fiction writer you are, that it basically digests down to that. Mm -hmm. um, and the first poems I wrote were like little scenes with line breaks in them. And they weren't really poems, or maybe someone would see them and think they were. I didn't really feel they were. Um, so it was discovering like, you don't have to have characters. You don't have to have a setting. You don't have to have a narrative. You don't have to have things happen in order. Um, you can do anything as long as you are mindful of it and you know can 
sort of figure out what you're doing. Um, you know, never falling into the trap of being obscure for the sake of it, but um, you can do anything. So it was really just trying to chalk out the borders of those freedoms, limits, whatever, and uh, working within them. And again, like responsibly playing with them, breaking them, but not hurting them in the process. Thanks, Dan. Break them, but don't hurt them. Yeah, I well, you were as you've been talking, you you've kind of like talked a little bit about this like sense of mindfulness around writing, and like I'm just kind of wondering like what like do you have like a mindfulness practice as you write, and like what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. um, like, how do you cultivate that? Yeah, um, mindfulness is something like irrespective of the writing, I I try to be good with. I mean, I am very much a head in the clouds person, which is the opposite of mindful. <laughs> um, with the writing. And I don't know, you guys, I'd like to hear your take on this, but I think when it works, you go into this space where you are both observing yourself and being in the moment at the same time. And you mm -hmm. know it's working, but you, it's like you, you don't drop the pins or the plates, you, you keep them all in the air. Mm -hmm. And I think that partly is a result of practice. And it's just, it's a form of hypnotizing yourself. It's a form of cognition you can yeah. learn, yeah. but it's also it's the blessing of the writer gods who on this day, I will give you a poem and, and don't screw it up on me. <laughs> so I don't know. Do you that resonate with how you guys work? That liminal space. Yeah, for sure. Right. There's like a, a tension between kind of how loose my mind needs to be and how kind of, yeah, how bound it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is a, a really, satisfying space and even when I dip out of that knowing that it was there is often enough to to get me to sit down again and give it another mm -hmm. shot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely I was, oh, okay. go ahead Dan I was saying I, I read years ago um someone it might have actually been Agatha Christie weird mm -hmm. weirdly enough but someone said like a professional writer is someone who writes even when they don't feel like it <laughs> and uh I I don't do this as my profession but I I do observe, like, even if I don't feel like it, sometimes I, I make myself sit down and try to just bring something out. And a lot of times you, you still can. Definitely. So, go ahead, Gabby. I wanted to hear what you had to say. Yeah. I, well, I was just, it's, it, for me, it's like, I, I experience it like a flow state almost, I think. Like, mm -hmm. it's like I, and I think when I was first writing, I would tap into it kind of willy nilly. And I wouldn't really <laughs> sort of like throwing darts at the, you know, at the wall. Like, I don't know, am I going to like, am I going to get into that space? And, and sort of like what you're saying, Jessica, like, it's like almost like there's like a container and like, it's like I get inside the container and then I let the flow happen in the container, like in the boundary space. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, Dan, it's like, it's like pursuing that even, even when it doesn't feel like it's coming easily. Right. Um, and like, and, but then also I have this, I don't know if anybody else has this experience, but like poems come to me at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> like I'm driving or like, you know, I'm, I'm doing mm -hmm. something and it's like, mm -hmm. I'll get like a little download. And then sometimes I have to like, I have to let it go. I actually can't sit down to write it. Mm -hmm. And then I just have to trust that it'll come back in a different form later. Or like, I'll pick up the pieces of some thread of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I have a lot of notes on my phone that I, that I took at midnight when just before you're falling asleep, like, oh, I can't let that go. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. Kim yeah. Adonizio um, writes about poets living in many directions mm. right? and writers living in many directions. And, and I've always appreciated that because for me, that's kind of counter to this myth about like the suffering artist who locks themselves in their room and stares at the ceiling and says like, come to me poems, you know? Um, and there was something really affirming about that for me because there was something really, such clear permission to be in the world mm -hmm. as a writer and lots yeah. of different ways of being in the world. Um, and then when I think about that notes function, I don't know if you've all listened to the Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green, but he reviews mm -hmm. the notes function. <laughs> he reviews aspects of the human centered experience on a five star scale. And yes. one of them is the notes function. And I think about how many notes I have on my phone <laughs> for poems that may or may not manifest, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Those two things cross my mind. 
So I love going back and thinking, why on earth did I write that down? Yeah. That is awful. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. But it's great to give yourself permission to be awful. That is, mm. that can be the hardest thing. And I still struggle with it. Write, write a shit poem. Just do it. Yep. Absolutely. Get it out of the way. Yep. Get it out. Get it out there. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, Dan, I'm curious when I thinking about um, your decision with your book to work in sections mm -hmm. and, you know, as we're thinking about just kind of all the ways in which we work with craft and then you get to that place of putting together a collection, yeah. right? Not just these things that are notes on a phone or a poem in this journal or a poem in that journal. So kind of what drove you to these three sections and kind of how do you see their interplay in the book? It was kind of, part of it was just um, almost a defensive decision. Like there are so many obviously overlapping pieces that if I don't organize them, it's going to, it'll almost look like I'm just repeating myself rather than presenting a sort of a varied look at one particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, someone would be like going to the book, like, didn't I read this one already or something, you know, something like that. Um, so it, it was just, they sort of fell that way. Um, and as I realized as I was going through it, it's like, I, I have my, my little hobby horses that I don't seem able to let go of. Mm -hmm. So just, go with it rather than fight it. You know, there was a second half to that, that I think I, that has possibly slipped my mind. Can you um, remind me as far as you were asking about organizing it into. Oh yeah. Just wondering how you saw these three sections, you know, it, speaking to each other. Oh or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. Um, that part I, of it. I think um, one, I think it was Gabby who, asked about like memory and time. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that threads through all of them. And I think there's the sort of memory of who you were, which plays in a lot of the pieces. There is what I think of as cosmic time, which is just time off of the human scale, mm -hmm. you know, mountains eroding and, or just time is not measured. And then there is the subversion of it where maybe everything happens at once or things happen backwards or, stuff that I that's kind of the the experimental side of it if you like just trying to explore other ways of just thinking about how you move through the world how you experience your own life um so I think there's they they you can get very explicit views of that in this in the sections but I think they all sort of play off each other in a way I think they are stronger together than they would be separately in that sense yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Hearing about that. Um, Gabby, I know, did you have anything else you wanted to ask about in terms of that, that memory and time and that aspect of Dan's work that you've been thinking about? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm curious about like, this is sort of another piece I think that I, I asked you about as well that I feel like kind of threads in with this is like, just that the interplay between like, kind of realism and the fantastical mm -hmm. and time and things are kind of liminal, but then they're also really rooted in reality. And I noticed that a lot of your poems seem to kind of move in and out of those spaces. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of curious, like what, what inspires you to do that? Like what kind of, you know, what's moving through you when you're, you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm going to move from here to here. And like, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking about this and um, cause I, I just sort of figured out for myself and I think, uh, it, it's it's kind of a rebellion against this this universe of of these unbreakable rules of cause and effect and logic and time going from past to present to future and you know our brains kind of impose this order on the world and I want to break that mm. and throw people's brains for a loop not in a <laughs> not, not in a shocking way, but in a way that just, because I think um, I used to read a lot of, of surrealism years ago. And uh, and what I got to like about it is I think if you can serve up the right image or sort of serve something up in a way that confounds those expectations of cause and effect, narrative, whatever, you kind of, you, you throw their brain into a space where 
Like for a second, anything can happen. There, anything is possible. It's almost you're back to the child brain mm. where, you know, why can't I go up and pet the clouds or whatever, you know, that, that sort of unformed, no expectations form of thought, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which is so hard to get into, especially I think for me, because I'm a very, I can be very left brained, um, which is not necessarily an asset for a poet, but um, it gives me something to sort of uh, strive for. Um, but I think it's it's wanting to sort of create this sort of shock that's not shocking, but more delightful shocking. Mm. Like um, maybe you'll go, oh, I, that, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't imagined that in that way before. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's a great thing to give to people. Um, that's kind of what, that's what I, the work I like to read does that. And the work I like to put out in the world does that. Mm. Um, I, I will also say you're talking about realism. And I was thinking about that too. And I, I'm sure some of the pieces are realistic. I don't think of them necessarily as being that. I think what it is, is if you put the right details in your piece, as long as they're the right specificity and the right level of observation, they will strike the reader as realistic, even if they're not. Hmm. You know, you can write about a, a walrus sitting on laundry. And if all the other details are right, it doesn't become weird anymore right. or maybe it becomes weirder. Like one of the two, you know? Right. Um, so I think it, it's the sense of you know, observe well and pick out the few things that matter and you will ground them in whatever reality you're putting together for that piece. And uh, they will, it will feel realistic no matter what's actually happening. Mm. Dan, I, I love, love that. that. <laughs> I really love that. Well, and really to me, this also, there's, this connects, I think, back to mindfulness and back to the playfulness of Mm -hmm. mindfulness, right? Mindfulness does not have to be this laborious, like, I am so mindful, (laughs) you know, right? (laughs) Right? Exactly. Exactly. So much of mindfulness is play is just being really present and, and really Mm -hmm. giving yourself permission to just kind of like, oh, is one of my favorite mindfulness practices is, is kind of like, is this a dream? Right. Right. Oh, whoa. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm living with two young humans. You know, my seven year old pretty consistently these days is asking, are we in my dreams? (laughs) I'm like, it's maybe, I don't know. We can only hope so, really. A friend of mine um, told me a great one that he does. Um, He said, if I traveled back to this day from 50 years in the future, what would I want to observe? (sighs) What would be the most meaningful thing? Like, right. Whoa. Exactly. <laughs> That's a really big question. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. A walrus on laundry, perhaps. Exactly. Why not? Toads in the suburbs. I mean, that's one of the things that I love, Dan, about your work when I think about um, when we think about what's surreal. Mm-hmm. And the suburbs being mm. this really surreal creation, right? A way of being kind of in community that didn't really exist. Yeah a hundred years ago. Yeah. Well, they're, they're living terrariums really is, yes. you know, that's a good way of describing and, and it. to talk about that piece with the toads. What I love about that one is that was a verbatim headline from the Atlantic.com. Oh. I did not think of that at all. <laughs> so <laughs> you find these things, you cannot let them go. I mean, right. They're gems, treasures. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's funny, you know, you were saying earlier, Dan, like, talking about that sort of like, as we've been talking like mindfulness and like the, the interplay of like the, you know, rooting, like being rooted in a reality that's maybe different than ours mm. and the child state. I think like, I think I try to do, I think I live in that place too. I think I'm always kind of like trying to roll around in that place. And a lot of my poetry mm. writing, yeah. um, it's just very like very liminal and very like, Oh yeah. Like what was it like to be a child? But then, not not just like observing the child but like being the child yeah. and like remem- like seeing the world in a different way and yeah like it's just yeah it's interesting to see like like how we do sort of similar things but in very different ways well and and you you know you got me thinking like we sentimentalize childhood to a great degree and it's important to um remember all the bits of it i mean there's one piece i didn't read it um but it was um about it was something that happened actually a few things that happened to me when I was young, where I was mowing the lawn and I actually accidentally ran over a snake <laughs> and my, whatever I was, 12 year old self just went, Oh, 
that's kind of cool. Not like that the thing died, but like that just happened, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. never did that before, you know, it, and that sort of innocence has lots of facets to it. Right. Um, and childhood, childhood wonder can encompass a lot of things. And part of the effort is to be open to all of those things, even if they might make you go, Ooh, <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. That's, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Right. It's like holding the, the multiplicity and like the, like the dichotomy of being alive. Like this is true. And this is true. Yes, exactly. And even if they contradict, that's totally valid. Right. Mm-hmm. And Dan, I feel that in your work, I really feel when I, and, and again, you know, just observing two young humans navigate the world mm-hmm. and, um, and there, the, the surprise, the fear, the joy, mm-hmm. all of these things happening often at the same time, um, if you don't as an adult try to overfunction for them and mm-hmm. kind of like make them box that in. And so I'm wondering when you think about your poems, if there's any poems that you would wanna bring back into conversation here where you feel like there is kind of that, um, like some of those, that childhood tension, that kind of the, the wonder slash slightly, there's like maybe to some terror, or there's something that might be mm-hmm. terrible or terrifying to an adult, but the, is yeah. it necessarily to a kid? I'm also going to shift my light for a second. So I'm going to pass the baton to you on that one. Very moody, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that piece I was talking about, about mowing the lawn, there's another image in there um, about lifting a dog's tail to see what would happen, um, which again is is an, an early memory of mine uh, when we had a dog and I just, as a child, would like, oh, I wonder what this does. And uh when I read that out, I mean, I, I got some, you know, the feedback came in and people were just like, Ooh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it reads as cruel on the page and it's, it's sort of unthinking rather than cruel. I think cruel has intention to it. I think it's just this, again, it's that flip side of innocence of, I want to see what happens right. and it may not be, you know, that, that is how you learn. Right. Um, unfortunately right. or fortunately, whatever, shouldn't judge it. Um, that's the one that may, mainly come. I'm I'm pleased with that one because of the way it does that. Um, I'm trying to think of the other one. I think the the one that I read um, about the uh, um, going back to the house and and running around and, and crawling on the bedroom floor and all that stuff mm-hmm. um, kind of gets into that space where memory sort of becomes intentional and what actually happened becomes blurred with what I feel happened or what I feel must have happened because I have these images and they mean this to me. So therefore you're almost forensically reconstructing your own past hmm. and, and living in it at the, at the same moment. Um, mm-hmm. So that's it. Yeah. That's, it sort of mingles with that, that childhood innocence. There's also the, the adult who is bringing intention to it and, trying to, you know, because, because it, it, it's hard not to, um, to sort of inhabit it or to shape it to some agenda that you have. Mm-hmm. Even if the agenda is to not shape it, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of like, it's, it sounds a little bit like time traveling between different mind states, right? There's like child mind and adult mind and it's like inhabiting, cool. yeah, inhabiting. Yeah and having those things differently. I like that. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have a very specific poem, Dan, that I just want you to talk about, because I'm just really curious about it. That's cool. Could you, would you talk a little bit about um, bruising primary fight? Yeah, um, that was, that's really an exercise in language. Um, the origins of that are just so stupid. Um, I, I, kind of a political news junkie and every year in primary season there's this cliche of so-and-so candidate was was locked in a bruising primary fight mm. if you google this phrase you will get all these political like essays with this phrase in it and i kept seeing it and i wanted to like rescue it and actually like imagine like a gladiatorial contest of primary hues <laughs> where they're embodied by something and what do they do and it doesn't thoroughly hold together. I mean, it's a little ridiculous and it's a little 
you know, tangerine and saffron sleeping with each other's spouses. I don't know why they do that. Um, uh, sky throwing itself in people's faces, you know, um, it just, it just felt a, a place to let some energies run riot and be what they wanted to be um, and, and have fun, honestly, doing it. Um, the one thing I, I will say that piece does that um, isn't necessarily remarked upon is there's a line um, in the absence that is whiteness in the culmination that is blackness. Um, though that is simple reference to the fact that white is the absence of all hues and black is all the hues put together. Mm -hmm. um, it can, uh, there's obviously other um, connotations for what those lines could mean, but that is elementally what they mean and why they are, why they say what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I'd be curious to know what you thought of it, if you wanted to bring it up in particular, and if I shattered what <laughs> you were starting to form. I don't, I, I just, there's something about that one in particular, I think that just really captured my imagination. I mm. think I love like personifying like colors. Um, yeah. It felt really, it feels really whimsical. I would say. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you guys, how, um, how many of your pieces start with a title? Ooh, almost none. <laughs> yeah. I'm a late titler. Uh, what about you, Gabby? Yeah, they don't usually, the title really? usually comes later. I um, usually pull it out of the poem or. A lot of times like the first line gets promoted to title. <laughs> yeah. So the title is stupid. Just take the first line and let that be the title. But um, hard these days. Yeah. <laughs> I, get a a lot, I get a lot of phrases that demand to be written as poems. And I, I just wondered how, how true that is for other people. Mm -hmm. So answer in the comments. Not that I feel you about the phrases, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They don't always live in the role of title, but there's definitely um, just a series, which is where I was appreciating when you were talking about that move from prose to poetry, because mm -hmm. really for me, I, when, I, when folks ask, why am I a poet? I typically say it's because I cannot write dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't think in characters, I don't think in the way, I don't think in people conversating. I just, mm -hmm. I don't think in that arc. I, I think, in images and I think in moments. And yeah. so that really spoke to me about that, that shift you made in your own craft. And yeah, I, I had to sort of teach myself to do that. Mm -hmm. first, first realize I had to and then figure out how to do it. Um, but yeah, now, quite a few of mine to get, just to round off the title discussion, but quite a few of those in that book um, started with a title and mm. kind of grew legs from there. That's so unique. Could be. Well, maybe not. Maybe a lot of people do that. I don't know, but it feels. Well, Lauren seemed. I, I saw a brief blurb of Lauren saying that she did it. Hopefully, nice. The way I nice. interpreted that correctly. But uh, anyway, find my little. Thing. What sort of moments capture your attention the most, Dan? Like, like, what, what, when you're moving through the world, right? And like, oh yeah, I'm gonna write a poem about this. Like, what are the things that you know? Obviously, there's themes in this book, but I'm sure you write other things as well. And. I'm just sort of curious, like what, what captures your, your eye? That's interesting. Um, I think I tend to be a digester. I need to room, they, they need to tumble in the rock tumbler for a while. Mm -hmm. And then when I sit down, um, I mean, we talked earlier about getting inspired at midnight or whatever, but I wouldn't say that happens a lot. Um, I think the act of, there, there is that act of sitting down with the intention to write that sort of gives the brain permission to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to open this sluice now and all of the rocks are going to tumble out if you've managed to save any. And then often it'll come to be like, oh, this thing that I had been thinking about but didn't realize I was working on a poem, I thought I was just thinking about it um, in the way I will, you know, wonder how they get the filling in Twinkies or whatever. But this other Hello. thing I was thinking about was actually something I can write about. Um, so I don't know if I can answer that as far as, you know, being in the world and being sort of struck by something and, you know, directly being inspired by that. I don't, if that happens, it, it's not coming to mind. I don't think it happens very often that way. I tend to be a ruminator. In with thinking about that, Dan, I'm curious, a poem that really captured me was Antidote. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just 
there seem to be a lot of the elements that you're speaking to maybe coming together in this particular poem. And I'm just wondering if, if you even do remember, I mean, sometimes it's totally, I've definitely written poems and not remembered how it came to be. No, right? no, no, I get you. But, um, um, that yeah, I do remember. Um, that started with the first line, which actually I got from a movie, um, Poison Against Poison. Mm. And I, I started to just, just, it's really just following that premise, like what antagonistic things can you put together? You know, Mandrake and Salamander is kind of like vague Chinese medicine reference and then rattlesnake and a kick in the butt and then you let it go from there. And I think something about that, and I can't quite say why this happened, but it it seemed to suggest aging and the sort of conflicts of dealing with your own body and your own whatever struggles as we sort of creak into middle age. Um, and early on in playing with it, it, I came up with the, the sort of the various justified alternating stanzas. So you have sort of one side and then the other side almost commenting or paralleling the other. Um, but it really started with this sort of rhetorical idea of antagonistic forces maybe putting together to heal or resolve something. If that actually happens in the poem. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate that. I, and I think one of the things I really also, um, there are maybe some ways in which your prose writer life Mm -hmm. It seemed to work really well in this poem that the, the little moments of dialogue that you capture there is mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a character arc there's some character development but not in a way to me that feels yeah prosaic it does feel very deeply poetic it just I don't know it seemed mm -hmm. like the elements came together really well in this poem at least from my reading of it back back when I was a fiction writer I actually used to like dialogue that was one of my favorite things to do mm -hmm. and I don't feel it works often in my work um I mean, you're, you're puncturing the reality of the piece to a degree. You're, you're mm -hmm. injecting another voice and you have to be very mindful. There's that word again about when you do that and make sure it's doing what you want it to do. Um, but yeah, when I can, it's, it's fun to just get it exactly right in a very tiny space. You know, you, know, you can't monologue in a poem, or at least I can't. I mean, it's interesting, Jess, because I, I know I've seen a fair amount of your work and there is an there's an element of monologue in your work. I mean, it is there, there is not often the contrasting voice, but there is the yeah. definite tangible voice. It's not an anonymous speaker in the clouds. It's, no. you know, I won't necessarily say it's you, but it feels like you to me. Um, it's definitely but, like, pretty unabashedly first person yes no this, question is, about this is an identity this is yeah this is not some like i said voice in the clouds which i i like that quality a lot yeah. well thanks well i like i i love the way that you have some of this third person interplay and then you bring in this you voice sometimes right. too, where you mm. reference this you or this she sometimes in some of your work and so i like the range of voices that come into your collection yeah thank you um yeah, it feels it, it's a way of, um, you know, I think we talked about that in workshop one time about um, suddenly throwing in a third person pronoun to sort of send it in a new direction or add something to it. And it's like, you got to be careful about that too. Don't do it just because you're stuck. Um, but you can do it in a way that actually, you know, illuminates what comes before it and, and improves it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that is the balance to strike with that, I think. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Gabby, is there anything when you think about your work, when you think about this interplay of voices that um, comes to the surface for you? Hmm. I feel like I, I've been thinking about this a little bit recently. I mean, a lot of my poems and the things that I write are from experiences that I have and that it feels like there are very particular voices that want to come forth and, and share. And I think that I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, like I'm, I'm not like an English major in any sort of way. And so it's hard for me to even to describe like what it is that I'm doing exactly, but it's like, mm -hmm. 
it's like, yeah, all these different voices. And sometimes it's like the describing of those voices. And sometimes it's the voices themselves. Um, and, and I think predominantly it feels like particular voices to me. Um, you, you say you felt you tended to write most often from your own, from real experience. Yeah, I, I draw, it's like, I draw a lot from, well, from childhood and from like, 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 I think one of my favorite things to do as a poet is to take like internal, undescribable felt sense experience and then try to like do something with that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's describing that from like an outside perspective or like trying to embody that, like, like how could I put words to like this thing that's happening to me and connect it to something that somebody would understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's definitely the direction I tend to go. Um, mm. I, I have a terrible habit of time traveling in my writing though, in terms of like what, what speaker, you know, if it's like first person or second person or third, oh, those yeah. sorts of things. Like it's, I, I like, I just go all over the place and then have to like, kind of like reel it back in. Um, and I find that it's like, yeah, it's like a process almost of like determining, like, like, are we looking at it? Are, are we living it? Like what's, mm -hmm. what's happening? Um, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like the final that's like the final iteration is like doing that kind of like pers perspective taking. I, I think Caroline's wanting to inject. I wanted to say one more <laughs> thing. I think I actually, if anything, I have a harder time writing from direct first person because mm -hmm. like talking about myself in a lot of ways just bores me. Cause like, I want to talk about other things. <laughs> and so I have to like, if something seems to want to come out, I have to, sometimes consciously like let it come out and be like just mm. let be let this memory be your poem let this whatever this is and 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 put it out there and you know just uh honor it i guess or uh stand by it but uh, yeah then this oh, that's, that seems to be good final word words honor it and stand by it um, Gabby, Jessica, and Dan, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been so fascinating to hear y'all talk. Um, and I just wanted to let everyone know that if you have any questions, to put them in the chat. There's already one question there, but please ask your questions now, and I will read them to Dan and Jessica and Gabby. Let's see. The one that I have goes back to something you talked about very early on. And the question is, so would you say mindfulness and writing is like attentiveness to the poem coming and knowing where you stand as the poet? And I can read that again if you oh, want. No, I, I, that's pretty close, I think. Um, yeah, I think, however, I mean, it, it's that simultaneous being in yourself and being out of yourself. Uh, however you frame that to yourself. Um, and I, I definitely want to hear what Gabby and Jessica have to say about it, but um, that's really how it feels to me. Um, but I, yeah, what do you guys think? Um, I think I spoke about this a little bit in last workshop about how one of the things I'm trying to resist is the temptation to put everything into one poem. Mm. And for me, that is a practice in mindfulness is Dan kind of mm -hmm. what you were saying about Really, it's a space of non-judgment. Like if this is the poem that's rising, if this mm -hmm. is the poem that um, when it sits on the page and I've spent some time with it and, and like you, I, I often ruminate. So it's, I, I will tuck things away for weeks or months at a time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then go back and kind of reacquaint myself with it. Um, and so for me, right, as I've developed my own personal mindfulness practice, I think that's giving me more permission to just let a poem be and not making it do too much work. Mm -hmm. um, oh man, I'm, I am, I'm checking my Irish Catholic forebears everywhere because they want all the work all the time and not every poem has to do all the work all the time. <laughs> Gabby, what about you? Where are you at? Yeah, yeah, I, well, I, I, I agree. I think, I think like a lot of like my mindfulness practice and what I think about is like, yeah, it's like, it's like not letting the inner critic run the show and like the self-editing process, right? It's like you just let it come out and then it is what it is. And then, and even, and then the, the you can, you can attend to mindfulness after that too. It's like, you can, it's like being in relationship to it authentically in some way, like not, like not, yeah. Like not trying to make it be something that it's not, not trying to make it do more work than it needs to, but like really like almost like a listening practice. Like what is this poem really saying? And yeah, then yeah. how do I like, 
how do I help that breathe life into that? Mm-hmm. I like how you, you, in terms of listening, you know, it, it's trying to communicate to you and you mm-hmm. need to be receptive to it and let it be what it wants to be. Exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. that help, that's helpful. Okay, I, I see we have another, another question came in. Um, it says, in Dan's book, a lot of tenderness emerges, but the voice doesn't emerge as overly sentimental or gooey. Is that something, Dan, you've uh, considered in your, in your process? And how does how the tenderness emerges, but how to keep it not sticky or saccharine? I, I think it's, it really just comes down to being both cynical and just wanting everybody to love everybody, you know, um, both of those, bo- both of those poles are in me. Um, I have, I, I have the impulse of a parodist a lot of times. And a lot of what I write will start out almost like making fun of something because that's what my mind just goes to. Um, but I, at the same time, I don't want to denigrate things just, you know, for no purpose or introduce bad vibes into the world. So I think the, they, there's a natural seesawing of those impulses that kind of make, kind of comes out in the work and, and gives it that sort of, you know, like hopefully not sentimental, but, um, you know, not cold either. The art of the loving roast. <laughs> I like that. I'll take that. <laughs> Well, Dan, I will say, I just wanted to note that in, in the way in which you do, when I think about the suburbs or when I think about the way you like are reflecting back on childhood, you become a, some of these moments that you capture, um, you know, with like the house party, you know, just these gatherings that could really go into a position of like incredible judgment or critique mm. and you don't go there. Um, you, you might have some humor or you might have a little bit of kind of like a, really, is this, is this mm-hmm. what it's about? Really? But, <laughs> but not cruel. And I, yeah. I really appreciate that. I, that is one thing that I will say is, is one of my niches in, in the workshop, in our dynamic is I am the one who is like, don't judge, men, don't judge in this poem, like whoever I'm reading, you know, let the thing be and let the reader decide that it's a bad thing or a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's something I feel very naturally. Um, I, yeah, I don't have to think about it much anymore because it's just it's just how you're supposed to do it, I think. Maybe that's a gift of your left brain. <laughs> Patting lefty there. <laughs> to me, it sort of feels like you're not afraid to like look in the shadowy corners, um, but you don't highlight the shadowy content. Like it's like you're yeah. you're there and you're like observing it. Um, but yeah, the humor is like really diffusing. Like it kind of brings yeah. like a sense of lightness or like, oh yeah, like it's like, oh, we're all... We're all dirty human beings here together. Isn't that funny? Like, yeah, yeah. You know. I, I get my angsty stuff out of my system at some point, you know, and it's right. So you, you can go into those areas and not be all like, you know, tortured and I'm going to wear black and, you know, turn on the black light and whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, and sort of keep really a sense of proportion. I think that's what humor is about. I think Dorothy Parker said that it's sense of humor is not about appreciating things comic. It's maintaining the proper sense of yourself and who you are. Hmm. Uh, let's see if we can move on. We have one more question. Um, and uh, let's see, it is, in what way is poetry a collaborative process? Gosh, um, I, I, I struggle to think how far I would have gotten without my co-writers in the workshop. Um, I hope I can see a few of them are here, hopefully uh, more than I'm not seeing are here. Um, not merely for the actual feedback that's provided. Some of, you know, I mean, some of which you just, it's not usable because it's not you, um, but just knowing I can bring something to an audience that will read it in good faith is such an amazing thing. And it's, I take it for granted, but I, I shouldn't and none of us should because it's a privilege that a lot of writers don't have. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm always grateful to whoever shows up every month when we, when we do our gatherings and, you know, spends their time and energy on what I have done. 
hopefully that answers that. Okay, I just, thanks. I just, just wanna say that I just appreciate you speaking to that because I think that also counters some of the mythology around kind of this isolated artist. Yeah, the I, tortured artist thing. Oh, and that's, that's, that's a little shit. <laughs> exactly. Down I'm bored of that. <laughs> so just really or you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> Cool. And, and I guess if, since we're wrapping up, you two, Gabby and Jessica, um, super thousand thanks for mm. reading it and having all these great questions and observations and giving me the chance to actually think about what I do because I don't do that very often. Um, so um, I just I think it's so cool. I can't wait to return the favor in the next couple of months for you two. Yeah, such a pleasure, Dan. Absolutely. It was so great to sit down with intention and to read your book knowing that we were going to have the chance to truly talk about it um mm. and to nothing nothing more satisfying for me than hearing from a, art or, an artist about their work and, yeah. and mm -hmm. being able to be in conversation with everybody so thank you thank you guys all right thanks so much y'all um i have a little bit of information to send us off and um first just an extreme amount of gratitude for everything that y'all poured of yourselves into reading and creating your art and having this conversation and I'm just gonna pull up a little bit of parting information for us here. Um, our 2021 titles are going to um, be published in September, but pre-orders are available now. So you can pre-order um, any of Gabby's, Dan's, or Jessica's books at firstmatterpress.org. So if that's interesting to you, you can hop over there. And then our um, 2022 submission period is also open. So our editors are reading currently. Um, so if you have a completed or near completed um, first chapbook, first full length collection or an innovative genre bending work, we'd love to take a look at what you've been up to. And I'll just like um, really say here that um, we really mean near completed. So if you, if you feel like you've really thought through all the way, but it's not done all the way, we're open to proposals of what you've been working on and a cross section of the work to start the conversation there. Um, and you can find more information about that submission period on um, the firstmatterpress.org website. And then just to um, kind of invite you to a couple different writing communities that many of us are a part of, um, uh, Eastside Poetry Workshop has come up a couple times tonight. So if you're interested in learning more about them, you can find them on Meetup if you search for Eastside Poetry Workshop in Portland. And then I also host a open mic night that happens on the fourth Sunday of each month. So that's another little poet community. So if you're curious about that, um, you can always email me at ash at ashgood.com and I can give you more information on the open mic and tell you how to get on that mailing list so you can get invites for there. And